Like a bride beautifully adorned and waiting anxiously for the arrival of her bridegroom, so Jerusalem waits for the coming of the Messiah. In that day alone will she be fully exalted. To find out more, stay tuned for this next episode of The Prophetic Connection. I'm walking in the noisy Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, the rebuilt Jewish quarter. Between 1948 and 67, this part of Jerusalem was occupied by the Jordanians. They destroyed the synagogues here, and the place was in mourning for nearly 19 years because the Jews were not allowed to be here. But no longer, you can hear the sound of drums, the excitement of a bar mitzvah ceremony as a boy comes of age. And as they walk to the Temple Mount, and in procession, drums and voices, the sound of praise in Jerusalem once again. Jerusalem will be exalted, the Bible says. The prophet said she will become a praise in all the earth. How close are we to that day? These voices of praise, the sound of the drums, tell us we are closer than ever before. For thousands of years, the city of Jerusalem has been called the City of God. According to the Bible, it is the holiest city on earth because of this mountain, Mount Zion, also called the Temple Mount. It was here that David set up God's tabernacle, and it was here that King Solomon built the first Jewish temple. One thousand years after that, King Herod's temple occupied this holy site, the very temple that was so familiar to Jesus and his disciples. However, during the 400 years of Ottoman or Turkish rule, from 1517 to 1917, Jerusalem would never have been recognized as the city of God. Today, nearly 100 years after the end of Turkish occupation, Jerusalem has been transformed. Yet even today, the city is far from glorious. War and political tension fill the air, and poverty is rampant. So what is it that remains so special about Jerusalem, and why is it that the Bible calls it the holiest city on earth? The scripture tells us that God chose this city, Jerusalem, uh, to be his resting place on earth, to be a special place of worship for him of all the cities and countries of earth. And um, a friend of mine, Lance Lambert, points out often, we have no water here, there's no lake here, there's no river, there's no port. Uh, I miss that, I love water, grew up on it. Uh, it's not spectacular in any natural way, there's no huge mountains to look at nearby, there's no ocean nearby, it's not far, 40 miles away, but uh, what makes it special? God chose it. Why did he do so? We don't really know, he just did, and because of that, he exalted it by that choice to a special place. And the Jewish people, wherever they are on earth, their synagogues face this very city. This is where they pray to. According to 1 Kings chapter 8, every prayer of Israel should be directed toward Jerusalem no matter where Jews are on the earth. This is because God eternally blessed and exalted this humble mountain by placing his name here. Yet according to the Bible, a time will come when Jerusalem will be exalted higher than ever before, and this holy city will be a praise in all the earth. One prophecy even tells us that the lowest of Jerusalem's mountains, Mount Zion, will one day be raised up, and God's word will emanate from it, reaching the entire world. So the, the elevation of Jerusalem, which is obviously a spiritual concept, 
is really tied into the whole national historic mission of the Jewish people and the whole idea of what Messiah is about. And we Jews have always understood that the Jewish people's role in history is not to be to conquer the world or convert the world, but to be a model for the world, uh, to teach the world about relationship with God and how to run the world correctly with the right values and spirituality. And that where that's going to come from is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the spiritual source. It's the power supply, not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole human race. While some believe that the Temple Mount is no longer important to God or a source of spirituality for the world, there are many who maintain that if God placed his name on this mountain forever, as the Bible tells us he did, then its spiritual significance continues as before. The question is, are there visible signs today that Jerusalem is once again becoming a spiritual blessing to the earth? As the Jewish people have returned to the land of Israel, as Jerusalem is being built, so too tremendous knowledge is just entering the world. And it enters the world through the Holy of Holies, through the, the holiest place in the world, uh, through the foundation stone. That knowledge comes down and spreads out to the world. So if somebody in Palo Alto is designing the next iPhone, it's because there's a, a Jew in Jerusalem who's returning to his ancestral land. Uh, there is something, um, there are many who are so excited about Israel's medical breakthroughs and scientific breakthroughs, they are part and parcel with the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel. As our people return, as God is seeing his dream uh, uh, come to fruition, so too is he letting knowledge in down into the world. And the messianic process will be twittered, tweeted. It will come on your iPhone. You will see it live on YouTube. Things are going to happen, and they're going to happen through the great broadcasting of the miracle that's happening here. When they talk about Jerusalem being rebuilt, I mean, Jerusalem is rebuilt. The city is far larger than it ever was, and the, bu the buildings are very nice. The rebuilding is always talking about the temple. The idea that the temple will be rebuilt, the third temple, which is always synonymous with messianic redemption, and, and Jerusalem being the highest spiritually of all cities on the planet Earth, and the reinstitution of the whole service that went with the temple, meaning from a Jew traditional Jewish perspective, the priests go back into action, the, the, the sacrificial worship uh, is reconstituted, everything takes place again. But the whole idea is ultimately that, you know, since we know that God doesn't need to eat meat, sacrifice is something that's for human beings. Only, only coming in contact with death makes life valuable. That's why we age, because then we take, in age we wouldn't take life more seriously. So that, the whole concept of, of Jerusalem being rebuilt and the temple service being put into place, all has to do with Jerusalem becoming the, the spiritual source and, and being a source of radiance on a spiritual level. And if you read the words of people like Isaiah, who talks about, you know, that the word of God will come from Jerusalem. It's that idea that once the Jewish people not only are physically back in the land of Israel and physically rebuilding their city, but that the city becomes the spiritual power supply, then the entire Jewish people with Jerusalem at its center will be radiating that spirituality and that meaning and that message out to the rest of the world. Both Jewish and Christian traditions maintain that Jerusalem will not be fully exalted until the Messiah, for Christians, Jesus of Nazareth, comes to rule from Mount Zion. In that day, his kingdom will extend to the ends of the earth, and all nations will be subject to him. That exaltation will just keep growing when his government is based here in a full sense. The government rests upon his shoulder. There will be no, uh, th there will be no decrease, but just an increase of his rule and reign, we're told by Isaiah, and it will be from this very city. So there's no place like it on earth. I tell people, I look out my window here, 70, 80% of everything that's in the scriptures took place right in these few square miles right here. Uh, the prophets, the, uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, so much of the scriptures, King David, the various kings and leaders of Israel, right here in this city. So there's no place like it. And uh, just a little plug, if you haven't been, come. It's uh, a unique spot. You'll never be the same after seeing Jerusalem. We have to build this city. We have to make it grand and glorious. God's vision isn't just words. It's not just poetry. It's a blueprint. It's a call to action do it. And I was recently in, in St. Louis, Missouri, and I saw the arch, the great St. Louis arch, and it was gorgeous and beautiful and large. And I thought to myself, my first thought was, we need one of these, and we need it in gold. And that's the way to think. A person has to be a Jew, and a Gentile who loves Israel needs to be jealous for Jerusalem, jealous for Jerusalem. Put Jerusalem first. If you have $10 to, to spend on charity, nine bucks should go 
to building Jerusalem, especially for Jews. For Gentiles who love Israel, this is an unparalleled opportunity to be part of God's vision. He says to you in the Bible, he says, this city is going to be magnified, glorified, and lifted above. You can be part of his vision. That's really the great gift that God gives us in this time, is not to see his wonders, not to, to, to view his miracles, but to actualize his miracles, to be part of his dream, to make his vision a reality. That's the greatest gift that God could give us, to be part of his story. Today, it is the prize in a tug of war between nations. Ultimately, it will be under siege once again as the nations try to change God's status quo for his beloved city. Against this backdrop of never-ending tension, it's difficult to see how God's dreams for Jerusalem can ever be fully realized. I am a Middle Easterner. I'm from this land. My father, Abraham, he's originally from Iraq. And after Iraq, he moved to Turkey. And after Turkey, he moved to the Holy Land. And from the Holy Land, he moved down to Egypt. And from Egypt, back to the Holy Land. I am a solid Middle Easterner. I know perfectly well my Arab cousins. They don't scare me. I know how to deal with them. I'm from here. I know their prayers. I know their mannerisms. They don't make me afraid. In fact, I think they're afraid of me because they thought, that they thought I would never come back. But I'm here. So my Arab cousins are going to have to deal with me. Anybody else who wants to take the city is going to get a fight for me. And anybody who wants to love this city is going to be my friend. It's a cool November morning in Jerusalem. One of the most poignant stories in the Holy Bible is the story of God's testing of Abraham. The Bible says that God brought him to the mountains of Moriah, meaning Jerusalem, and there he tested him by asking him to be prepared to sacrifice his own son, Isaac. Of course, the story has a happy ending because as he's about to sacrifice Isaac as a test of his faith, an angel stays his hand, and there is a ram caught by its horns in the thicket and it becomes the substitute, the sacrifice. But I tell you this story because I'm standing in the very place, the ridge, where Abraham probably had his first view of the mountains of Moriah behind me. In Genesis 22, in the first verse, we read, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Can you imagine this test of faith? But remember, Abraham was the first Hebrew, the father of the nation of Israel. So he had to be faithful to God and could hold nothing back from God. And this was a test of his heart, of his faithfulness. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now you are seeing modern Jerusalem over my shoulders, but this is the scene that Abraham would have first seen of the mountains of Moriah. The way of the patriarchs is to the south. It begins at Beersheba or Beersheba and comes all the way up here to this ridge. So when it says that Abraham saw the place afar off, he was standing somewhere here. I'm standing on the way of the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it says in the scripture in verse um, five, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So the young men were instructed to wait somewhere around here while Isaac and Abraham went to the mountains of Moriah behind me, and the test took place, and then he returned here afterwards. And so this is what happened in this very place. But it's not the end of the story where the mountains of Moriah are concerned. Because we read in Micah in chapter 4, and this speaks of the days just ahead of us. 
In verse 1, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and many people shall flow to it. You can see the Golden Dome, the Mosque of Omar, in the distance behind me. It's the low place. It's believed to be the place where Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac. But the Bible is telling us through the prophet Micah that this hill, this Temple Mount, is going to be exalted even higher than all the hills that are round about. And then the text says in Micah 4, in verse 1, And many people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And to the house of the God of Jacob suggests that the temple will be standing there because the temple is God's house. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. The Lord will teach the people his ways and then they will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth. And Zion is a synonym for Jerusalem. And then it says, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I'm standing holding the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is going out from Jerusalem. But in that day, it will be the word that comes from God himself going out from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Isn't that a wonderful image? No more war, no more conflict, no more suffering, death, no more mourning. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And then it says this, speaking of Israel itself, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. The people of Israel could be afraid today. There are threats from those who want to wipe them off the map. We live in times of, of great tension. And so the people of Israel, looking into the faces of their children, could wonder what the next day holds, what the next month, the next year. But these are days of great tension. And even though life goes on as normally as possible in Israel, there is always in the background the concern that war could happen at any moment. And so this speaks of a different day when a man, a woman, can sit under his fig, their fig tree um, and be at peace and confident in the Lord. No one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. What a beautiful image Micah paints of the days that lie ahead when the Messiah comes. But all other prophets had much to say about this as well. Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah puts it this way in verse 1. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion, meaning for Jerusalem, with great zeal, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord. And then this promise from God Almighty, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And the holy mountain is over my shoulder. Where you see the golden dome of the rock today, a Muslim mosque, that is located in the place of the Temple Mount. This is holy to the Lord. This is where God said, I will place my name. First Kings chapter nine, verse three. So this is the holy mount, or the holy mountains of the Lord. And that is at the very center of it, where tradition says, Abraham was prepared to sacrifice Isaac, the holy mountain. And then these words, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with a staff in his hand because of great age. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, many young men and women of Israel have been cut off in the prime of life, defending Israel from her enemies. But here we have an image of people living to a ripe old age, uh, supported by a cane. What a descriptive image that Zechariah paints for us. 
The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Isn't that amazing? There'll be laughter, the voices of children playing again in the streets of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts. If it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts? God asks himself a rhetorical question, as if to say, how can this happen? But he already has the answer. He is saying, this can happen because with me, with God, all things are possible. We're living in a day of tension when uh, people would wonder what the future looks like. But God is saying the day is coming when Jerusalem will be exalted again, exalted above all the hills. And this is his promise to Jerusalem and to the people of Israel. And then he says, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. And of course, by inference, from the north and south as well. It means God's going to bring his people back from all over the world where they've been scattered and bring them back to the land of Israel so they will fill the streets of Jerusalem and the towns and villages of the Holy Land. Verse 8, I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Jerusalem will be exalted because God has promised that Jerusalem will be exalted. We have come a long way in our journey with the prophets of Israel. We have felt the excitement of the prophetic future the things they have told us that we can expect in the days that lie ahead, when the Messiah will return to this holy city, Jerusalem, and when Jerusalem itself will be exalted above the hills, when all men will sit in her streets, and when children will play and dance in the streets of Jerusalem. But where are we on the prophetic timetable? When will these things come to pass? I believe we get a very strong clue in the writings of the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 62, in verse 6, Isaiah says this, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Now the walls of Jerusalem behind me, imagine the stories they could tell of the armies that have come here and laid siege here and tried to capture this g glorious city of God. What stories these walls could tell us of those days. But God says, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. In, that, in those words, the urgency of the moment, there is no time for sleep, much less rest, because there's a sense of urgency. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. You know, we live in a day when we as Christians who love the people of Israel and desire for Israel to have her glorious future, we cannot afford to be silent because the voices of anti-Semitism are loud against Israel. And there are those who would destroy the people of Israel if they could. So we are told by the prophet speaking for God, do not keep silent. It is a time for us to speak up for the people of Israel and give him, give God no rest, till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Can you imagine what the prophet is saying? He's telling us to challenge God, to give him no rest. Now, obviously, we must do this with reverence, but it's to say to remind God of his promises that he is going to exalt Jerusalem. So that's what the prophet means. Now, we have gone on this journey with the prophets of Israel, and we've showed you the places here in this holy land. But I want to invite you to come, if you can, come with us to the land of Israel in one of our future tours and look at the information on the website uh, going across your screen. You can find the information there about upcoming tours. But not only that, if you can't come, then let us bring you here in another way through the DVD series that we have produced that are seen on television all over the world. They will help you understand more about Israel. 
thank you for watching this series on the Prophetic Connection. We look forward to seeing you again in the future as we share more about God's holy people and God's holy land.